Good afternoon, everybody. Bill Kennard here with Grandy and Associates. Welcome to this webinar where we're looking at a little bit of information regarding uh, the, the payroll protection program and more specifically, the forgiveness side of that equation. All right, so many of you have got your PPP funds. Now what? One of the challenges with this entire program is they keep changing the rules. This is truly a case where we're, we're flying the airplane while we're building it. Again, they put the, the PPP program out so quickly that they're having to go back and rewrite clarifications and rewrite uh, 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 you know, processes that go along with it. And it's been a bit of a challenge because for some of us, we've had our money for a long time. And as a result of that, uh, quite frankly, uh, you know, they're changing the rules as to how we play the game in the middle of the game. And so uh, uh, they came out with the applications for the uh, payroll protection program. And, and so for the forgiveness of your funds for your payroll pr uh, protection program. And so I wanted to spend a little bit of time walking through that process, walking through the applications and uh, kind of letting you know what needs to happen with that program. Now, a couple of things that uh, certainly play a part in here. As we start rolling through, uh, certainly, uh, you know, feel free or know that if you have questions as you're watching this, uh, feel free to send us an email. Our team is at your disposal to help you uh, in any way that we can uh, uh, within our ability here. So uh, let's look at a couple of things that are in here. Why are we doing this? Number one, there is a bunch of confusion. Again, like I said, they're changing the rules as we're playing the game. Right. This particular version of this webinar was recorded on, uh, uh, I think we're, uh, we're June 18th here. And, and so some of you watched an original version uh, that was done back on about the June 5th and, and, or somewhere in that range, a little bit earlier than that. And, and, and uh, so, again, on June um, 4th, President Trump signed into, in, into, uh, uh, into law the Payroll Protection Program Flexibility Act of 2020. Whew, say that fast three times. Right? And, and, and that, again, changed some of those rules that we're playing the game by. And so as a result, there's a lot of confusion in it. Uh, and so uh, the, the original application that they, get, they, they uh, provided a month ago is no longer applicable. And so I want to walk through this particular version. We'll cover all of the same information, but we also want to give you the updates as a result of the applications that were just re, uh, released on, on June 16th. Right, so there's a couple of things we want to take some of that confusion out of the puzzle. The next thing is things are starting to open back up. The economy is starting to move along. Now, there's no question our businesses, yours, mine, will be different as we move forward. This is going to change things. If you're sitting back waiting for business, you know, for this to just be over and business to go back to normal, it's not. You're going to be waiting a long time. We need to change the way that we're doing things within our companies today. And so uh, that is one of the things that's absolutely critical. So our businesses will be different. We need to pay attention to that. But if we do things right, we can come out of this stronger than ever. The economy was pretty good when this whole thing started. And so, again, we look at it now. How do we come out of it? Again, we need to do things properly today. Use our funds properly. Use them wisely. Take care of the reporting that we need to. We can come out of this in great shape on the other end of it. So let's take a look at a couple of different things as we jump in here. Again, this whole government stuff is really confusing. And it's confusing in an over, uh, already overwhelming season. Think about that. A lot of you are dealing with shutdowns. Your customers are, are, are shut down. And, and we've got the whole uh, uh, the, the, the limitations that are, are put on our business in terms of how we have to do things different. And then on top of all of that pandemic stuff, then we've got all the protests and all the rest of it. And it's just, it is a bit of an overwhelming season. I get that. Our goal here is to bring a little bit of clarity to the entire PPP confusion uh, area. Right now, again, the SBA has issued the guidelines for the loan forgiveness. That was done a month ago. They've now issued uh, uh, new applications that have come out for uh, this particular uh, program itself. And so I want to bring you up to date on all of it. So first off, let me tell you what I am, what I am not. Right? I'm not a banker. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an accountant. We deal with Catalyst Consulting, and they are awesome accountants. If anybody needs a recommendation, call me. They are the people to deal with. Right? Uh, I'm not a government employee. What am I? I'm a business owner just like you with the same problems, the same concerns, and it's our goal to help. 
Our firm belief here at Grand Union Associates is the more companies that we can help weather this storm, the better off all of us will be collectively. And so we've just spent a lot of time. It just so happens that our customer base is, is such that you know, what we do for a company is we help companies understand the number side of their business and how do we improve profitability. This whole pandemic thing kind of impacts that a little bit. And so we've spent the last several months doing nothing but living and breathing and trying to understand uh, these pieces of the puzzle. And we do that with the help of our CPA uh, uh, as we kind of sift through some of this stuff with our banker and, and just making sure that, that we understand it the same way they do. So my name is Bill Kennard. Again, you know, we, we, we've been doing, you know, I've been in the, in the trades industry for 35 years. I've been a business owner for 15 and so we're dealing with the same issues that you are. Our business was absolutely impacted by this. We took a significant uh, impact on some of the revenue because, again, uh, your business changed. As a result, our business has changed. And so we look at this piece of the puzzle, right? And that's where I'm coming from. Now, there's a couple of different elements with regard to the payroll protection program that I want to clarify uh, as we start. Let's call it foundational items, if you will, right? Number one. Remember, the payroll protection program um, is set up that you could apply for those funds and then the, they would be forgiven at the end of that period. Loan forgiveness is not automatic. Some of you were a little bit nervous at the beginning of this whole thing because you were taking out a loan, right? And look, if they're going to be forgiven, why not just forgive them and you know, give you the money and forgive it and be done? It was set up this way for a specific reason, and it was a pretty wise reason, quite frankly. It was set up as a loan because you, the recipient of that loan, have to do something in order to get those funds forgiven. If you don't do them, they're not forgiven. In effect, if they just gave you the money and let you run and do what you wanted to do with it, well then, who says those funds would ever be used for their, their intended purposes? You have to do something. In other words, you have to provide reporting. You have to show that we use these funds for their intended purpose uh, and nothing different. Right? So, again, you have to apply for forgiveness, and there are details that go around that that have to be adhered to. So we'll look at certainly a chunk of those. Now, the next thing that's in here is, again, remember that we created a website specifically geared around this. Right? And you can find that at grandiassociates.com forward slash untangle. And on this page, that's, that's our placeholder for everything for this, uh, for, for this program. So you'll find information on applying for it. If you haven't applied for the loan yet and you still want to, you'd still have a little bit of time. The last day that uh, uh, PPP funds can be approved is June 30th. So you do still have a couple of weeks if you need them. And there is still money available. We've also got a whole host of information on the forgiveness portion of this loan. I'll be referring throughout this program to a number of different resources that you can go out and download and utilize. And you're going to find them on this Untangle page. And so, uh, again, that's where those resources will be. You'll hear me talk about it as we go through. There's one other point of clarification that's really important here. There's been some confusion uh, recently over... Um, uh, you know, whether you'll be audited for the account or whether you won't be audited, that kind of thing. Now, one of the things that's there is if you remember on the original application for the PPP program, uh, the second page, you had initial all those boxes that essentially said that, yeah, hey, all this information is true. Right. And one of the items that you agreed to was this one, which said the current economic uncertainty makes this loan request necessary to support the ongoing operations of the applicant. And you initial that. Well, one of the questions, right, then you heard on the news where you had companies like Shake Shack and P.F. Chang's and some of those major companies applying and receiving $10 million, and they really didn't need it. And, and, and all the fallout that happened as a result of that. Again, one ha you know, and then what happened is, is, is SBA and IRS said they're going to go back and audit every company that received PPP funds to make sure that they really needed it. All of a sudden, again, it's changing the rules that we're playing against. I just want to be clear, right? Because the question is, who defines uncertainty? Well, the SBA put out a clarification on this point, and I wanted to give you the verbiage exact, right? And so basically, it's a good faith certification of economic uncertainty. Basically, they stated that any borrower that received PPP loans with an original principal amount of less than $2 million will be deemed 
to have made the required certification concerning the necessity of the loan request in good faith. In other words, if you requested less than $2 million, they're going to assume that, yes, you didn't need the money. If you requested more than $2 million, then we're going to go back and audit and just double check to make sure that you did. Right. So if you're less than $2 million, you should have no problem whatsoever. There, in fact, some of the, the accompanying documentation said that if you requested less than $2 million, odds are your company isn't big enough that you've got the liquid reserves to have carried you through the last couple of months. And so you did need the money. If you were greater than $2 million, eh, chances are you had some funds that were, that were there. Right. So I just wanted to clarify that point before we got into the actual application for loan forgiveness. So let's move in that direction. So the application itself, the original application that was released about four weeks ago was 11 pages long. Leave it to the government to come up with an 11 page application for forgiveness for a loan that the original application to even get was only two pages. Go figure, right? Now, when I started digging through this loan, those 11 pages, there were really only four pages that you needed to complete, right? Pages three, four, six, and nine. Most of the rest was instructions. And so what they've done is on June 16th, issued two new applications uh, for this. The first one is Form 3508. And again, we've got links to these on our website. So Form 3508 is, I'll just jump out of your way a little bit here, is a five-page application. In effect, it's the same basic application as before with the flexibility changes without instructions. Again, I said earlier that even in that 11 page, you only needed to fill out four pages. Well, the last page, right, the fifth page, if you will, is uh, they're looking for demographics, which was, is purely voluntary. This new one still has it, so you don't have to worry about that page. It's really the first four pages that you're dealing with. The second one that they, they gave you, right, is this Form uh, 3508EZ. This is a simplified application, much easier. Uh, and here's the thing. It doesn't apply to all of us. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through the, the first application, Form 3508. We'll walk through all of that one because that applies to everybody. And then after that, I'll spend a couple of minutes going through for, uh, for uh, the easy form because it is easy. And once we've talked about all this, then I already know the answers to most of that. So we'll kind of dig into both of those real quickly here. So with the application itself, there's a couple of things, right? So when you get the application, you know, uh, typically you look at that and you start filling it out from page one and working your way through it. Well, as I started looking at that and, and, and trying to do that, you find out that it keeps referring to stuff later on in the application. The best way to fill out the PPP forgiveness application form is from the back forward. Start from the back page and move yourself forward. So we're going to start out really at worksheet A, tables one and two are on page four of the application, right? So this is what the page looks like, okay? Worksheet A, Table one is where we're going to start, right up at the top. We'll kind of dig into detail on each of these areas. So I'm going to focus on that table one to begin with. So to start out with on this table, number one, we're going to fill it out. These are for all employees in the company that earn less than $100,000 per year. They would be listed on this form, right? So we start out with the employee's name. We fill that in. Next one is the employee identifier. The employee identifier is the last four digits of their social security number. That's what we put in that form. The next one is the cash compensation. Now, again, this is going to be how much did we pay them over the covered period? And so the question comes up, what is considered compensation? So let's talk about that for a moment. Compensation is going to be uh, considered all gross salaries or wages, any gross tips, uh, commissions, paid leave, right? Paid leave, not including the leave that's covered by the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, the FFCRA. That's covered under a different portion of the CARES Act, and so you're already receiving the credit on that side. But any other paid leave would be covered. Any separation pay, if you had to release somebody and you came up with some separation pay for them, that can be included in here as well. All of these items are considered part of their cash compensation. 
So that's the first item. Now, the second item, I just want to add a quick note in here real quick. Many of you have asked me about, can I pay my employees who did come to work during this period? Can I pay them a bonus or increase their wages? And many of you actually called it hazard pay. And the answer to the question is absolutely yes, you can. But I would caution you, the more I think about that term hazard pay, the less I like it. Because you don't want to set a precedence. If we call it hazard pay, now what happens when this whole thing blows over? We don't know what's coming up down the road. And so, uh, you know, when the next major issue comes along, right, and there's issues like this, I don't want my team members to come back and say, well, I want hazard pay, right? You can call it essential worker pay, call it something different, or, hey, in your next couple of checks, we're going to add a little bit extra in there for you uh, for coming into work during this, right? Don't give it a name. But I just don't want to set a precedence. Just kind of keep that one in mind as we go through that one. Right, so we're going to enter in what is that total compensation, cash compensation uh, that we talked about for each individual employee. The next item is going to be the FTE or full-time equivalency. There was a lot of questions about this when the, on the original application. How do we define a full-time employee? And here's the thing, FTE stands for full-time equivalency, not full-time employee or full-time employment, it's full-time equivalency. So let's talk about that a little bit. How do we calculate that? They have defined that very clearly. There are one of two different methods that you can use to define your full-time equivalency. The first one, method one, is, is it's called the standard method. We just simply take the average hours worked per week divided by 40. If the, you know, and, and then we round that to the nearest one-tenth, and the maximum is one. So in other words, if, uh, uh, if you've got an employee that's worked 40 hours or more per week, their full-time equivalency will be one. If they work less than 40 hours a week, then we simply take, so for example, here I've got an employee working 35 hours a week. We take 35 divided by 40, comes out to 0.9. That particular employee has a full-time equivalency of 0.9. We'll do that for each employee working for the company. Now, that's the standard method. That's the first one that we can use. The second method that we can use is called the simplified method. Now, the simplified method simply says uh, you know, if, if an employee is working 40 hours or more per week, their full-time equivalency is one. If they work something less than 40 hours a week, their equivalency is 0.5. And you might say, well, why would I ever want to do that? If you look at it, let's say I had an employee that was working 35 hours a week before, and now they're working 15 hours a week. Well, again, before they were less than 40, which means they're 0.5, and now they're less than 40, which means they're 0.5, which means you haven't reduced your headcount. And again, remember, one of the parameters is that we have to maintain headcount of our employees in the company. So use that. You can use either method. It's your choice. They state very clearly, you can actually use either method. And so you can, you know, I'd run them both and find out which one favors you more, right? And then use that as you move forward, right? So it's your choice as to which one of those methods that you use. So I'll figure in, you know, this guy is a full-time employee. Full-time equivalency is one, all right? The next uh, box that's there is the, the salary or the hourly wage reduction. Did I reduce their wages? Now, remember that, uh, again, stated that not only do you have to maintain headcount, you couldn't reduce their wages by more than 25% over uh, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the period that we're comparing it against. And so let's talk about that one for just a little bit. Number one, you'll complete this only if their wages were reduced by more than 25%, right? And you're comparing that back to the covered period. The covered period is going to be from January 1st to March 31st. That's what we're going to compare their wages to. You're looking at their average annual salary or hourly rate for that period. What was it per week then? What was it per week or hour now? All right. Uh, if the wages were not reduced by more than 25%, we just simply enter zero in this column. All right. Now, if you're not sure if you went beyond that, uh, in the instructions, right, it used to be in the full packet, but now they pulled the instructions or a separate document, uh, which you can download from our website. And so uh, in the instructions itself on page four, there's a quick worksheet where you can walk through it, these three steps to help you determine, did I uh, decrease uh, wages, average wage 
for each employee by more than 25%. So you can walk through that. It'll tell you exactly what that factor would be and therefore how much of a reduction penalty we need to add uh, into uh, our formulas here. Again, if you reduce their wages by more than 25% without uh, valid reasons here, right, then at that point in time, um, the amount of your loan that's prorated ends, uh, the amount of the loan that's forgiven ends up being prorated, right? So uh, we'll factor that one in. In this case, I didn't reduce his wage at all. The next item that we want to look at then is the second line from the bottom, the full-time equivalency reduction exceptions, right? So that's the box that we have right here. Now in that box, right, do we have a, a, a valid exception for our full-time equivalency. So let's look at that one a little bit. Number one, uh, uh, there are valid reasons why your headcount, your full-time equivalency numbers would be lower. First of those would be you made good faith written offers to rehire uh, employees and they rejected it, right? So maybe you laid off some employees and when you tried to bring them back, they didn't want to come back. Remember, one of the issues is the CARES Act also provided for anybody that went on unemployment uh, they got their standard unemployment plus another $600 per week. So depending on what they were earning, they in some cases could make more money on unemployment. And so for some cases, they didn't want to come back to work. And what made that even more difficult is the requirement that you had to bring back any laid off employees by the end of June. With the Flexibility Act, they've now extended that out to the end of December. The thing to remember is that $600 adder kicker for the unemployment program given under the CARES Act expires at the end of July. So at that point, they're going to have to go back to work if they want to uh, continue making some money. So that's the first thing. Second thing you remember with that one is you had to have given them an offer in writing. So if, if, if that was all verbal, do yourself a favor, send them a written offer, right? And, and, and again, they need to reply back to you on that one to make sure th that you're in good standing there. The second one is you had people that either left or uh, 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 were let go, and you can't find a similarly qualified replacement. That was another one of the adders that was given in this Flexibility Act, right? So you're trying to find somebody, you just can't find a qualified replacement uh, for that person. Uh, and another couple of reasons, employees that were fired with cause. You had to let somebody go with cause, and you've got that documented, uh, you'll be in good shape. Uh, uh, any employees that voluntarily resigned, Again, you're not going to be penalized for that. Uh, and uh, employees that requested and you granted a reduction in their hours. They asked for a reduction in hours as a result of all this, and uh, you approved that. So those uh, are all valid reasons why your headcount could have gone down throughout the course of your covered period. Now, you're going to list only positions that were not filled by new employees. In other words, if somebody left or you let them go and you've already hired a replacement for them, then you're not going to list both of them, right? That's not, you didn't change headcount. You maintain headcount with that move, right? So you're in good shape there, right? So we come back to the foreman again. We've got to fill that with all our, our individual employees. If, if you need more lines, include a separate table, separate worksheet with all of your employees listed uh, with all the detail for each and you'll be in good shape. So we've got our, our numbers that are there. We're simply now going to tally up these three quest, uh, uh, columns, right? So the uh, compensation, full-time equivalency, and the wage reduction, you tally them all up. Now, once I get to this point where I've got totals, notice the labels box one, box two, and box three. Once we get to this point, we really don't care so much about all the detail up here anymore. All I want from this point forward is the totals in these three boxes. When we get to subsequent forms here in a little bit, they're simply going to say, go back to table number one and give me the value in box two. That's what we're doing. Okay. So that was table one. That's for all employees making less than $100,000 per year uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, annual compensation. Uh, now, on our, our Untangle page, the grandiassociates.com forward slash Untangle, I've got a spreadsheet that's out there that will help you with a lot of these numbers as well, 
right? So uh, on there, there's a, there's a tab on there, one a worksheet that's in there that's compensation reduction calculator. It will help you, okay, did I reduce the, uh, the, the, their wages by more than 25%? It just helps you to calculate uh, that and what your forgiveness reduction will end up being as a result of it. So you can utilize that, download it. Now, right now, the spreadsheet is only geared around an eight-week period. As soon as there's one release that'll cover the 24-week period, we'll get that posted out there as well. Now, that was table one. Whew, right? We spent a little bit of time there because I defined a whole bunch of stuff. Table two is for employees that make more than $100,000 per year, right? So table two uh, is for everybody else, right? Table one is employees under $100,000. Table two is for employees that are over $100,000. Now, here's one thing to keep in mind. Number one, the owner of the company does not go on either of these tables, this is just for the employees of the company, even if the owner takes some of their compensation out in the form of wages, right? So for example, like me, uh, part of my compensation is taken out in the form of wages. I receive a paycheck through payroll, just like the rest of the employees. I'm an employee of the company. I would not be included on this. As the owner of the company, you will put you on worksheet A in a different spot. Right? This is just the team members, the employees of the company themselves. So let's focus on table two here uh, just a little bit. Number one, you, you'll notice the columns are pretty much the same for the most part. Right? So we've got the employee, we've got the employee identifier, which is the last four of their social security. Uh, and then we come up with their cash compensation. Now for this group, there's a couple of differences. Number one, um, yeah, again, we've got that, those, uh, yeah, those limits. Now, the, the, the PPP program said that it would cover wages for any employee up to a limit of $100,000. And, and basically, they're saying, look, if you make more than $100,000, we'll cover the first $100,000. You figure out the rest. Okay? And so, uh, now on here, the Flexibility Act that was signed in, in, uh, into law on June uh, 4th basically said that uh, you can stretch from eight weeks out to 24 weeks. Now, when we start looking at that, here's where that comes in. So, if, if, and here's the other part of that, is if you received your funds on or before June 4th, then you have a choice whether you want to stick with the original eight-week period or if you want to go to the extended 24-week uh, period. If you receive your funds on July 5th or later, you don't have a choice. You're taking the 24-week period. That's, that's what they allow at this point. But prior to that, uh, you could, you, it's, it's at your discretion. And so if you're choosing the eight-week period, the maximum wages that you can have in here is $15,384 over that eight-week period. If you annualize that out over the course of the year, that's $100,000 per year. If you're choosing the 24-week period, the maximum you can put is $46,154. Again, if you annualize that out over 52 weeks, it's the same amount per week. It's $100,000 annually, right? So you've got those limits that you're going to put here. The program is not going to cover wages greater than $100,000. And then again, full-time equivalency, you calculate that just like you did uh, before. So at this point, once you've got those in place, again, we'll tally up those two columns, the cash compensation and full-time equivalency. Uh, and from there, you know, there is no wage reduction because you are reducing the wages under this program. Technically, they don't worry about that for people making more than $100,000. Again, remember, once we get to this point, all you're worried about is, again, the boxes on the bottom, box four and box five uh, in this particular uh, form. So remember, as the owner of the company, you do not list yourself in table one or table two. We'll cover you in a couple of minutes. Next, uh, so we, we, we go further down in the form. The bottom uh, section on the form then gets into full-time equivalent reductions, the safe harbor clause to it. Again, we're still on page four, still the very last page of really the, the meat of the application. And so this section here, uh, you're basically just going to go through and they're looking at, uh, yeah, again, you know, enter the borrower's total average uh, full-time equivalency between February uh, and April 26th, right? Follow that same method that was used to calculate the average full-time equivalency uh, on tables one and two above. In other words, the standard method or the simplified method that we talked about a little bit earlier, right? And, and give me the sum, right? So again, you're just going to answer those Five quick questions, and they will basically tell you, uh, uh, you know, did you meet that safe harbor requirement uh, for any uh, reductions that might be there? 
So that one's fairly simple on that page. Uh, again, that same spreadsheet uh, that we've got out there for, uh, for the, the PPP loan itself on the Untangle page has a tab on it where it will walk you through the, um, uh, the, the full-time equivalency, whether you're using the standard method or the simplified method. Right? and tell you again, are there any penalties that you're going to deal with there? Uh, again, this one is still geared around eight weeks. When there is a 24-week version, we will get that one posted as quick as we can. That's first step. First step is those tables one, two uh, on that page four. Step two is worksheet A, which is page three. So worksheet A, again, you look at it, it's not that complex. We just got to define a couple of areas out there. So let's start at the top. We'll work our way down. So really this whole first section, right? Schedule A worksheet table one totals. We're just simply bringing data over, right? Give me box one from worksheet uh, uh, from table one, box two from table one, box three, right? We're going to enter that in from table one, right? So we just simply bring that data forward uh, from the previous versions. The next area uh, as we go down, right? So the next section down uh, is uh, basically Schedule A, table two, right? So again, bring me box four and box five from table two. We bring those two over, right? So those are easy enough. There's really no calculations to do there. The next section here is the non-cash compensation or the non-cash uh, uh, payroll expenses. And so in this area, we're looking at a couple of different things. Line six is any employee health insurance that's being paid. Right now, this has to be a group plan. If the company is paying for a one-off life insurance or health insurance policy for you as the owner, that doesn't qualify. But if it's a group policy that's there, this is the employer portion of those premiums, not the employee portion that, that they're, they're already paying that. This is just the company's portion. Line seven is going to be uh, uh, and the employer portion of any retirement uh, plans that you have, a 401k contribution. Again, not the employee's share, it's just the company's matching share that would go into this box. And then line eight is basically any state and local taxes that are assessed on employee compensation. Now the question comes up in two different areas. Number one, what about the employee portion? No, they're covering that. That's not a company expense. And number two, what about federal withholding, FICA and Medicare? That's the biggest chunk. That is not a qualified expense. You're already receiving a write-off for those expenses uh, uh, on your taxes elsewhere. Uh, they're not going to let you double dip on that one. The only matching taxes that qualify are the employer's state and local taxes assessed on that payroll. So those uh, three areas fill in here. And that brings us to line nine. Line nine has got some changes to it. I said a little bit earlier that you don't list you as the owner on table one or table two on page four. You do list yourself right here on line nine, right? So this is any owner, uh, employee, self-employment, you know, general partners. This is the, the, the wages paid to the owner itself. Now, it's broken out here for a couple of different reasons. Number one, remember table, certainly uh, tables one and two, we're dealing with full-time equivalency. Well, as the owner of the company, you're here, you're still here, right? They, they're not factoring you into the full-time equivalency at all. Second thing is, we said, now this gets into, again, the eight-week versus 24-week thing that's there. So the first thing to keep in mind, number one, the maximum wages. If you're dealing with a eight-week period, your maximum is still $15,384. That hasn't changed. If you're using a 24-week period, if you remember, for your employees, the maximum went up to 46,154. For you as the owner, the maximum goes up to 20,833. They're going to cap it at that level. Because again, if you remember, when you applied for your funds, you took your average payroll for 2019, your average monthly payroll times a factor of 2.5. It essentially gave you 10 weeks worth of payroll that originally you were going to spend in eight, and then the remaining two weeks you could use for mortgage payment, utilities, things like that. Okay? They're still only going to let you as the owner take 10 weeks worth of wages out of here. And there's a clause, right? They've added to the instructions a, a, a little bit of verbiage, and it's important for you to understand this because this is a huge ad. Let me read it here. For borrowers using the eight-week covered period, 
This amount is going to be capped at $15,384, right? For the 24-week period, it's going to be capped at the $20,833 for each individual. Or the eight-week equivalent of their applicable compensation for 2019, whichever is lower. In other words, they're not going to allow the owner of the company to increase their wages higher just because we've got extra PPP funds available. The intent of the program was to make sure that we can keep our team paid. They, they, they basically are saying, we don't want you to increase your wages to make it look like the average wage is still up there. Meanwhile, we're penalizing and not bringing uh, uh, team members back. The intent of the program is to keep them working. So as a result, they are going to cap you the amount that can be applied toward the PPP funds at $20,833 for the 24-week period or $15,384 for the eight-week period. Kind of an important change there, so you need to be aware of that piece of the puzzle. The other uh, two items that are in there, number one, uh, again, remember that you would not list yourself out on on table one and table two of page four. And the second thing is if there are multiple, more than one individual owner of the company, then include a separate worksheet giving the detail for each individual owner that's there. If you have an ownership role, ownership stake, and we want their uh, um, compensation to be applied toward the loan, then it needs to be listed on that separate sheet. So that's, uh, that's kind of the, the, way, uh, the layout there. That one was kind of a big one, a uh, change that took effect. Uh, moving down a little bit farther, Right, line 10 simply says we're going to add up all those payroll costs, right? So add up lines 1, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9. Tally them all up, come up with your number. <clears throat> this next section basically gets, again, into that full-time equivalency reductions. And, and so yeah, there again, this is a change from the original application that came out a month ago. What they're stating is that, uh, that if you meet one of the three criteria listed below, we'll talk about those in a second. If you meet one of those criteria, you can skip lines 11 and 12 and just enter in one, a factor of one in line 13. So let's review what those three criteria are. The first one is that basically if you have not reduced the number of employees or the average paid hours, you can simply check that box and enter in one on line 13. That would qualify. You only have to match one of the three, not all three, one of the three, right? The second uh, uh, one is that you are unable to operate between February 15th and the end of your covered period at the same level of business activity as prior to February 15th due to compliance with uh, basically the health department CDC regulations, right? So for example, again, uh, let's take a restaurant, right? They're forced to shut down. And now that they're open back up, you can only open up at 25% of your total capacity. Again, they don't need as many people to serve 25% of the total customers. And so that's going to impact them. If that's you, check that box. The third possible qualification is, again, if you satisfy the full-time equivalency reduction safe harbor uh, uh, two that we went through in Schedule A uh, worksheet uh, 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 on the bottom of the previous page four. If that's the case, check here, enter in line one. If you don't meet at least one of those criteria, then you figure out, fill out lines 11 and 12. And that basically says, number one, what's your average full-time equivalency during the borrower's chosen reference period, right? So in other words, what are you going to compare it? What, 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 do you, what period of time are you going to compare your headcount to? And you can choose which one that you want to. Right, so you can choose. I want to compare it to the period of February 15th to June 30th of last year, 2019. I want to compare it to January 1st through February 29th of this year. Or if your business is seasonal, you can choose any 12-week period between May 1st and September 15th of 2019. Run them all. Use the one that works to your advantage. It's your choice as to which one of those that you use. Right, so what was the full-time equivalency there? What were the total number of full-time equivalency here? Add lines two and five uh, uh, up above, right? And at that point, you're basically going to run a math calculation. It will tell you if you have to take a penalty on that piece of the puzzle. So uh, again, that one's fairly simple to walk through as well. That's it for step two. 
right? So we've got page four down with tables one and two. We've got page three down, which is, uh, uh, again, worksheet A. Now we go to the actual loan forgiveness uh, calculation form, which is page one. Now, page one, that's the entire thing. It's not real difficult. Let's walk through these. We're going to start at the top and kind of work our way down. The top half of this, so we're going to start right in that block at the top first. So the start of this is we simply fill out the information. It's about our business, right? So at the top of it, uh, what's my company name? If I've got a, a DBA uh, doing business as name, I put that in there. The company, the address, uh, my uh, uh, FEIN number, phone number, contact information. I fill that stuff in. Easy enough. Underneath that, the SBA PPP loan number. This is the 12-digit SBA loan number that would have been issued with your PPP funds. This is not the same as the loan number for your bank. The PPP, uh, again, when the SBA approved your PPP loan, they issued a 12-digit loan number. Your banker should have provided that to you uh, up front when, they, when your loan was approved. If not, get in touch with them. You can get that number from them. The next one is the actual loan number from your lender, whether that was the bank or, or whoever you dealt with. They will have a separate loan number for their institution. Uh, the next item's here. First off, what was the PPP loan, uh, loan amount? So in my example, it's $80,000. And what was the loan distribution date? In other words, what day did the funds hit your account? And that's, a, that's an important date because it starts getting into coverage periods at that point in time. Next line, how many full-time employees, how many employees did I have, rather not full-time, how many employees at the time of the loan application and how many employees at the time of the forgiveness application? All right, so they keep coming back to that number. That was a key. The next line, the EIDL advance amount. So if you also applied, in addition to PPP, you also applied for the EIDL loan, right? And some of you remember that loan. EIDL is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. And you, if you applied for that one, that was one, you know, many of you refer to that one as that's the one that came with the $10,000 grant. Right, so you applied for that loan. They gave you the $10,000, which you could use anywhere you wanted in your business. Right? Well, if you got that, how much was that advance, the $10,000, and what was your EIDL application number? Because here's the thing. If you got that $10,000 grant, they're going to subtract that from the amount, uh, quite frankly, that'll be forgiven. All right, so they're going to take that into account. They're not going to let you double dip on that one. Uh, in there. Now, I, I know they said up front that, uh, yeah, again, th that money is free and clear. It's extra money. Some of you said it was free money, right? But again, they're not going to let you get that free money and the free PPP loan money, right? So you, you, they're going to subtract your advance amount from your forgiveness amount. Next one, payroll schedule. What's your frequency? Well, I pay my people uh, bi-weekly, right? So every other week we fill that one in. The next item is the covered period. Right, so I talked about this a little bit already. The covered period, the start of your covered period should be the exact same date that you received your funds. That was the start of your covered period. Now, the end of your covered period, again, is your choice, whether it's eight weeks or 24 weeks. So we can start out if it's eight weeks, you're simply going to take the start of that period plus 56 days to come up with your, your, uh, your ending period. If you're going with the 24 weeks, you'll take that start date plus 168 days uh, to come up with your end date. But again, it's all driven off of that distribution date that you have up here. The next line that's on here and the last line here is the alternate payroll covered period if applicable. In other words, you can choose for some of you, let's say I got my funds on Friday, but my next payroll period doesn't start until next Thursday. You could, if you choose, declare an alternate payroll uh, uh, covered period, which starts no later than the date uh, the next pay period starts within your company. The, first, the start of the first pay period after your disbursement date. Right? So that's one of those items that are there. You'll specify that either eight week or 24 week period that's there. The thing is, yeah, again, you can choose one, whether you choose eight weeks or 24 weeks, you can declare if you want this alternate payroll period, right? So for, for some of us, that might just make some of the reporting easier, right? Because now if it coincides with my normal payrolls, I can run a payroll report to show the data that's there and it's clean and it's easy. The other question that's come up several times is, um, I received my payroll funds 
my, or my PPP funds on the same day payroll actually hit, right? We issued checks on, on Wednesday. That's the day that, uh, that my, my funds came in. Will that apply? Will it, will it, can I apply that, uh, that, those dollars to the funds? The answer is yes. The verbiage in there is that the expense has to have been paid or incurred during the covered period. Right, so I've got some companies that I've worked with that say, okay, I, I hit payroll, that hit the day I received my funds, which means, quite frankly, the two weeks prior to my funds is when it was incurred, because that's what we're paying them for, but it was paid within my eight-week period. And then we're basically going to incur right throughout the eight weeks, and I'm going to miss that last payroll by one day, but if I wanted to go through and pull up the paperwork and validate it, I could actually, I incurred those last two weeks of payroll during that eight week period as well, I could include that in there as well, right? So some people say, okay, within that eight week period, if I'm paying bi-weekly, that means that I, in effect, could get five payrolls instead of four. Yes, that's true, but remember, you've only got 10 weeks worth of funds, right? And so you, know, you can only use so much money there at that point in time. So, but you can absolutely do that. You don't have to, but you can, again, Use if, 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 if with the eight and twenty-four uh, and the payroll, use the one the method that that benefits your company the most. So that's the top half. There is a checkbox right here that says if your uh, PPP loan amount was greater than two million dollars, check there again. Remember, if you're over two million, odds are uh, there'll be an audit involved in that. If you're less than two million, you won't have to worry about that piece of the puzzle, uh, in all likelihood. Uh, so this bottom section is really the dollar amount section of your uh, PPP loan uh, application. So let's talk about that in three sections there. So the first section is the payroll and non-payroll costs, right? And so if we look at it, line one simply says, go out to schedule A, grab line 10, bring it forward. Line two, what was your business mortgage interest payments? Now we're talking about business mortgage interest only, not principal. Right? So again, they're not going to make the, your monthly loan payment. They're only going to cover the interest portion of that loan. So the question that's come up is, but I bought this truck and it's on a zero interest loan. What, how much can I claim? Well, none because it's all principal. Okay. So that's the first thing that's there. Uh, uh, and again, no prepayments. They're only going to, the expense has to have been incurred with, you know, paid or incurred within the period. They're not going to allow you to pay forward a couple of months on that one. Um, next one, business rent or lease payments. Now, either of these needs to have been under contract as of February 15th of this year, right? So if you just signed a lease, you know, the 1st of May, that's not going to qualify uh, uh, under the, uh, the, the forgiveness portion of it. The other item is for lease payments. The definition or the clarification on that comes down right here, right? Lease payments, personal property items such as copiers, servers, autos, and other common items of personal property for the company that are leased by the business. Right? That's the key element there. If you own your truck personally, uh, that, that's not going to cover it. right? It's owned and covered by the business. So that means that, again, if I'm leasing trucks, that would cover uh, be covered there. Uh, leasing some of these other expenses, that would be covered expenses under line three. The next one, business utility payments. Now, interestingly, on the original application that came out, they basically said electricity, um, uh, electricity, gas, water, uh, and, and, and telephone. And then when the application came out, the forgiveness application came out, they added to it, and it's electricity, gas, water, transportation, telephone, or internet access. And so a couple of those items as we look at it, you know, telephone, either, either uh, uh, solid, you know, office phones or cell phones would fall under that category. Um, you know, but it's that transportation one that, that's kind of a, a question mark. And so they have actually clarified, issued clarifications on this point. Now, if you want some good, fun reading, go read the Federal Register for a while. Right? We found this clarification on something like page 21,735. Right, of the Federal Register, uh, 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 and it's volume 85, number 76, issued on April 20th of the Rules and Regulations. And here's the exact verbiage. Well, I'm going to call out a couple of areas in here to make it a little bit clearer. Right, so mortgage interest payments, interest on your mortgage for your warehouse that you purchased to store your business equipment, 
or the interest on an auto loan for a vehicle that you use to perform your business. Again, a business vehicle, not a personal loan vehicle, right? So that would be one of those, right? It's, it's very much clarifying that piece of the puzzle. The second one being business rent payments are covered. The next one, business utility payments. Example, the cost of electricity for their warehouse or your building or rent uh, uh, that you rent or gas that you uh, uh, use driving your business vehicles. Those are very clearly uh, listed as covered expenses. Uh, so uh, again, we've pulled out some of that information that's there. We've got, in fact, this specific clarification uh, listed on our Entangle page for you as well. Uh, the other question that comes is what about interest on other debt, right? I have a general business loan or my line of credit that I used to buy a truck. That is not covered expenses. Right? That's not the use of a line of credit. It's not proper use of it, right? And so those are expenses that would not be eligible under, uh, uh, under this clause. So that's the next one. The next section on here then gets into, again, full-time equivalency. Uh, they come back to that piece of the puzzle. So go out to Schedule A, line three, bring that number forward, right? Line six says basically add the amounts from lines one, two, three, and four, and then subtract the amount on line five. In other words, what they're doing here is they're subtracting any wage reduction penalties from your non-payroll expenses, right? So they're going to subtract that from that amount. We bring that in here. Line seven simply says, go out, get your full-time reduction quotient, right? Schedule A, line 13, bring that one forward. Uh, and, and so uh, again, we, we've got those items here. Now, Hopefully, for most of you, that, that question is going to be a one. It's a multiplier of one because you have the same number of people that you had before. This next section right here, right, lines 8, 9, and 10, what you're going to do is you're going to run three separate calculations to determine your possible loan forgiveness amount, and it's going to be one of those three that will determine what your forgiveness amount will be. So let me walk through those. Line 8 says it's the modified total. You're simply multiplying... Uh, basically, line six, right, all those amounts that you added up above times your full-time equivalency multiplier, right? So you multiply that out. What does that dollar amount come to, right? Line nine is what was your entire loan amount? Line 10 is basically saying, okay, divide line one, your total payroll costs divided by 0.6. Now, this is a change. Right, from the original uh, uh, application that was there, at least 75% of your funds had to be used for payroll expenses. In the, under the Flexibility Act, they've reduced that amount down to 60%. So at least 60% of your total PPP funds need to be used for, for payroll expenses. The remaining 40 can be used for, uh, uh, again, int mortgage interest, rent, leases, stuff like that. Now, one item here. In the old version, when it was 75%, at that point, if you didn't spend at least 75% of your expenses on payroll, then the amount that was forgiven would be on a prorated basis. The way that the new one, the Flexibility Act, was written basically you know, introduces like a cliff there that says if you don't spend at least 60%, none of it would be forgiven. Now, having said that, Members of both the House and the Senate you know, and SBF all, all said, well, okay, that's not the intent of it. It will still be prorated, but they haven't put out a clarification or specifically stated that, set, that, that at this point yet. So do yourself a favor. Make sure that at least 60% of your funds do get used for uh, uh, payroll expenses. So you, you've done three separate calculations. Line 11 simply says, which one of those three is the lowest? The smallest amount, that's the amount that'll end up being forgiven, right? So we put that in on line 11. That's basically the application, right? Now, page two of the application itself is just your signature page. It's got all the, the, the items that you're initialing to say, yep, this stuff is all true and valid uh, uh, to the best of my ability. There was a couple of questions uh, that have come up over and over again. And one of those was, hey, I had to lay people off. Do I have to hire the same people back or is it just a headcount thing? Well, as we kind of talked about with full-time equivalency, it's just a headcount thing. You do not have to hire the exact same people back. 
Um, and, and again, remember, in that spreadsheet that's out on the Entangle page, the tab that's on there on there for the loan forgiveness calculation, uh, uh, one of those will walk through and how much of, of an impact will uh, those people have So, uh, or any changes that you have to your team. So utilize that one. Uh, it can help you bring some clarity to this one. There's a, a couple of the other questions. Uh, when should I apply for forgiveness? Well, number one, you have to wait till the end of your covered period because one of the things you have to do is in, in addition to the application, you also have to give them payroll reports and copy your lease to show that, that the lease was in place and how much your monthly payment was uh, and all this other stuff. Uh, and you're not going to have all of that stuff until after your covered period. So that's the first thing that's there. Now, the the... the other question that's also come up after the Flexibility Act here is, uh, hey, do I have to wait the full 24 weeks before I can apply for forgiveness because I've run out of funds long before that? All right, let's say you initially were working on the eight-week program, and then when they signed the Flexibility Act into, uh, uh, into law, uh, they now gave me 24 weeks, but quite realistically, by the time I hit 12 weeks, I'm going to be out of money. Do I have to wait till the end of the 24-week period? Our understanding is no, you do not. As soon as your bank or your lending institution is ready to accept the applications, and not all of them are yet, as soon as they're ready to accept the applications for forgiveness, you can work with them and start to uh, uh, submit that application. Uh, next thing that's there, uh, I ran the payroll the day before the funds were deposited. Can I include that amount? Again, the question is, if those funds were actually paid to the employees the day before your funds hit, then they cannot. Right? If you run payroll and it's direct deposit and uh, uh, you know, I run it today and they don't hit the employee's accounts until you know, two days from now, again, if the expense occurred in your covered period, then it would qualify. If you wrote checks yesterday and I got my funds today, it's yesterday. Right? So they do not qualify under that scenario. And the last one is, uh, if our lease payment is prepaid through the end of July, can I pay additional months now and have those months qualify for this uh, window? Uh, that's there. You can't pay future uh, uh, expenses for this one. That will not qualify. So a couple of those that came through, they were good questions. Now, we just spent the majority of this time talking about the, the Form 3508, the full application, and I haven't really gotten into 3508EZ, the simplified application. The reason for that is it doesn't take much. It really is very simple. It's effective. It's a total of three pages. Again, remember that last page is just the demographic stuff that's optional. And so that's the majority of the application right here. Page two is your sing signature page with the initials. That's it. So let's talk about this one for just a minute. Number one, again, not all of you will qualify to be able to use the, the simplified form. You have to meet one of three criteria. Again, not all three, just one of the three, right? Any one of these. So the first one would be that if you are self-employed and you have no employees, you're a one-man company, you can use the simplified form. Not a problem. The second one of these criteria you did not reduce salary or wages of your employees by more than 25%, and you did not reduce the number of hours of your employees. In other words, you were busy throughout this period. You were still cranking. The guys were still working at least full uh, 40 hours or the same number of hours they were working before that. At that point, you would qualify to use the easy form. The third uh, uh, item that's there is the borrower did not reduce salary or wages of the employees by more than 25%, and experience reductions in business activity as a result of health directives related to COVID-19. Again, this would go back to restaurants and retail type stores where, uh, again, we, we were able to open back up finally, but only at a reduced capacity or 25% of whatever we can do. Again, I didn't reduce wages for the hours we're paying them, but quite frankly, we don't need full staff to take care of 25% of the customers, right? So that's really going to apply more to them. But if you meet any one of these three criteria, right, then you can use the easy form. Now, the good thing about this is, like I said, it's easy. The whole first half of that form is exactly like it was on the full form. You're going to fill out the exact same information. All, it's identical, right? The last half of that page, right, again, there's that, that question mark that says, you know, was your loan more than $2 million, your PPP funds? If it was, check that. 
If not, don't worry about it. That right there becomes the entire application from the dollar side. There is no uh, uh, table one, table two. There's no worksheet A. All that goes away. That's what you're filling out right here. And it's as simple as this. Number one, what were your total payroll costs? Enter it in. Number two, what was your business mortgage uh, uh, interest payments that you had? Number three, what's your business rent or lease payments that you had? And number four, what were your business utility payments? Same definitions that we used in the full application. No difference, right? So you define them the exact same way, right? So once we've got those four lines filled out, right, now we come to the next session, the potential forgiveness amounts. And again, it's, it's, you're going to one of three different calculations that will determine how much is forgiven, right? So the first one says just tally up lines one, two, three, and four above. What's that total dollar amount? The second one is what was your total PPP loan? And the third one is uh, take your total payroll costs, line one, divided by 0.6, just to make sure that you're meeting at least 60% of your payroll uh, costs uh, are, are going to this account. And again, whichever of those three is the lowest is what you end up putting in on line eight. That's it. Signature page on two. It's very simple, very easily, uh, easy if you meet one of those criteria that are there. So it uh, gives you a little bit more data, a little bit of information. Hopefully, we're able to answer some questions on that one. Uh, there, uh, one thing that's absolutely critical, regardless of where you stand uh, today, it has never been more important for you to micromanage your cash flow. And so on that Untangle page, grandassociates.com forward slash Untangle, if you're anywhere on our website, you'll actually see this orange bar up in the corner. Click that. It'll take you right there. When you get to this page, Right, you can basically scroll down, and in there, uh, we've given you a spreadsheet uh, to uh, to basically track and project your cash flow moving forward the next uh, 16 weeks. And it's a tool that you can download and you can use from this point moving forward, even after this whole thing is over. The second thing that we've got out there is uh, we've got a number of different resources. Um, again, running your business from this point forward will absolutely look different. If you're just sitting here waiting for all this stuff to be over and you can go back to normal, it's going to be a long wait because it ain't happening. What we do in our businesses today will absolutely change and how we interact with our customers will have to change. And so we've got a program that, uh, a, a, a training program that's out there leading through COVID-19 and beyond that you can basically register for. It's a great program that covers some, um, some, some good ideas, things that you need to be thinking about within your company. And then also, uh, we've got our two-day planning for profit workshop. We've got another one of these coming up July 21st and 22nd. Uh, uh, this has changed our business, right? So we've taken our two-day workshop, and instead of you having to travel for it, we're actually doing this online as a live instructor-led workshop. So we're still up here. We're teaching it just like we're doing you know, in this uh, uh, session here. Now, we've got uh, uh, coaches that are available that can spend time one-on-one -on -one with you during the two-day period. And when you walk out of there, you will know more about your company than you maybe even wanted to know. And so we've got that one available. You can register for that by clicking on the link on the bottom. And so, again, all of those resources are at grandiassociates.com forward slash untangle. We've also got links on there for uh, the, the new application as well as the instructions for the full application and the easy form. All of that stuff is out there. Uh, and, and again, grab those tools that are there, right? Now again, that, that cash flow uh, projector, you can go out there and download that. The, the, the loan forgiveness calculator is the one I've referred to several times throughout this uh, particular uh, workshop here. Uh, so again, go ahead and download those. Uh, there's no cost to them. All of these resources are here purely to help you uh, work your way through this struggle. With that, uh, that's really what we have in our session today. Uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us, call us, uh, just reach out to us in any way. We will help you in any way that we can uh, within our ability. Uh, and with that, make a decision to make it a profitable day. Stay safe.